Have you ever saved hay in mayo in the rain? Have you ever made hay in mayo in the sun? Have you ever carried above your head a haycock on a pitchfork? Have you ever slept in a hay barn? on the road from Mayo into Egypt. I am a hay carrier. My father was a hay carrier. My mother was a hay carrier. My brothers were hay carriers. My sisters were hay carriers. My wife is a hay carrier. My son is a hay carrier. His sons are hay carriers. His daughters are hay carriers. We were always all hay carriers. We will always be hay carriers. For the great gate of night stands painted red. And all of heaven lies waiting to be fed. Paul Durkin was born in Ireland in 1944. He was brought up in Dublin and in Mayo in the west of Ireland. He's lived in London and he studied archaeology in Cork University and he lives now in Dublin. His selected poem is A Snail in My Prime was published in 1993. His, his voice and the voice of his poetry have become a central part of the fabric in, of Irish life. In other words, he is a poet with a very large audience. He is impossible to categorise and in each book he moves into a new territory both in terms of his rhythms and in his subjects. Paul, could you tell us where you live in Dublin and how that affects your writing day and what sort of writing day you have? Mm. I live in Ringsend in, in Dublin, which is down in the Dublin Docklands. I live in lodgings there alone in a very small, in four rooms, four tiny little rooms, which are wallpapered and books. There are too many books there. Uh, in any case, I used to be a morning person for most of my life. I ha it had to be early in the morning. And, but now, what with the passage of time, in other words, getting older maybe, and uh, life in the city and so on, now it's the afternoons. So I potter about in the morning shopping, you know, going to the, the, the you know, getting the bread and the milk, the newspaper, uh, about which I always feel guilty. Um, buying a newspaper, but I usually walk across Ringsend Park to the Ringsend Village uh, to do those things, or I get into the motion car and go to the supermarket in Sandy Mount Village. Then uh, lunchtime, I listen to BBC Three radio lunchtime concert, you know, uh, string quartet or something. And uh, then finally, the necessary medicine, namely a flask of ground coffee and then for the next, for the rest of the afternoon, that's, that would, that for the last few years, that would be until approximately and Will you work on one poem, or will you have a few poems on the go all the time? Um, in the writing the first draft of, of a uh, book, I'll be going simply from first draft to the next first draft. You know, I'll be, so I'd be going from one to the other, depending on the stage of a book column. When I get to the stage of, uh, you know, second, third, tenth, twentieth drafts, I'd be obviously working on a whole load of different poems at the and same time. It seems to me that you work on a book rather than on poems. In yeah. other words, each book seems to me to be separate from the previous one in terms of its rhythms, its subjects, mm. Mm. and how you place the poems is very important in mm. each book. Mm. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, e with each, I do, so, uh, and at the same time, then, your life goes on. This is the day that is in it, as this very day you and I are speaking here. You know, the events that have already happened this morning so change the nature of things. So 
things happen in my own life or in the life of Dublin and Ireland and the world that will me interrupt, uh, not interrupt, but you know, will come into the what it is I'm writing, uh, you know, and so on. So. It's a, we're talking about a period of years here. And I, I, I said at the beginning that your poems are impossible, you are impossible to categorise, but yeah. the thing is that of, of all the Irish poets, you've written the most public poems and the most private ones. Mm. Uh, the most public ones will deal with matters from you know, the Irish hierarchy to what's mm. happening in Northern Ireland, mm. to just, especially in, in, in the last book, say, Greetings to Our Friends in Brazil, mm. will almost at sometimes be like a diary of, of, of current events. Mm. But then in other books like Daddy Daddy mm. um, and uh, The Berlin Wall Cafe, you deal mm. with your relationship with your father, you deal mm. with your marriage mm. in ways which are very private and mm. reveal a great deal that people in Ireland especially mm. are very hesitant about talking about themselves in that way. Mm. So, mm. you know, how does that work? Let's start with how does the revealing of the self in that way work? Mm. I mean, I, honestly, Colm, I, I mean, that goes way back to, I mean, it was just, it's not something, I didn't, you know, my marriage ended and that was the, the I mean, I, I reckon I've had about eight lives. Uh, you, you know, when people say your life is shaped forever by the age of seven, I, it certainly cannot be true of myself because, uh, you know, there have been, if, without being facetious, maybe eight disasters and eight miracles you know, and so, um, and each time you become another person or... Uh, yeah. But I think but that the poetry comes from a very serious part of the self. I mean, yeah. that you don't, the poetry isn't distant from you. The poetry comes right out of your guts, as it were. Yes, yes. Well, isn't that what poetry is? A, a, a vision of reality, as Yeats said. The Berlin Wall Cafe was written in the, out of the ashes of my marriage, and it, it was how, written out of all those feelings. But of course, there, were, there was, it was a long, there were huge fences to be jumped. Um, the most, the most, the, the Beecher's Brook of it being self-pity and all of that, you know, trying to get over all of that. Uh, but, and, and uh, but I see, I'm not conscious of, of revelation in the sense that you're speaking of it at the time of writing. I'm just trying to make, make, uh, uh, I often, if I'm thinking of myself at all, think of myself as a painter, um, you know, physically, like I sort of feel I'm, I'm to, have that, to have that kind of detachment from uh, what I'm doing. I can look at pieces that I'm writing, you know, and yet, of course, it's that, as Elizabeth Bishop said, wrote in a letter, that perfectly useless concentration uh, that's necessary for the making of a poem as it is for the reading of it. Mm. Will you read us another poem? Right. Uh, I am the Kilfenora tea boy and I'm not so very young but though the land is going to pieces I will not take up the gun. I am happy making tea I make lots of it when I can. And when I can't, I just make do. And I do a small bit of sheep farming on the side. It's the small bit of furs between two towns is what makes the Kilfenora tea boy really run. I have nine healthy daughters and please God, I will have more. Sometimes my dear wife beats me, but on the whole, she's a gentle soul. When I'm not making her some tea, I sit out and watch them all ring a rosing in the street. And I do a small bit of sheep farming on the side. It's the small bit of furs between two towns is what makes the Kilfenora tea boy really run. Oh, indeed, my wife is handsome. She has a fire lighting in each eye. You can pluck laughter from her elbows and from her knees pour money's tears. I make all my tea for her. 
I'm her tea boy on the hill, and I also thatch her roof, and I do a small bit of sheep farming on the side. It's the small bit of furs between two towns is what makes the Kilfenora tea boy really run. But I'm not only a famous tea boy, I'm a famous caveman too. I paint pictures by the hundred, but you can't sell walls. Although the people praise my pictures, as well as my turf perfumed blend, they rarely fling a fiver in my face. Don't we do an awful lot of dying on the side? But it's the small bit of furs between two towns is what makes the Kilfenora tea boy really run. I think one of the things that characterizes the last 30 years in our lives in Ireland mm. and your life as a poet is the way in which public events, things on the news, affect us all deeply mm. in a way that doesn't happen, say, in France or in the south of England, that you turn on the news sometimes, mm. whatever happens, either in the north or in the south, and it doesn't really matter which it is, mm. Mm -hmm. in very different ways, whether it was the violence or whether it was the peace process in the north, mm. or whether it was the bishops or the referenda or the mm. whole changeover in the south from a sort of um, religious-run mm. society to a sort of secular society. Mm. But those things or are like daily news, are, are like mm. they're happening to our family. Mm. It's, they're not distanced from us in yes. the way in say other countries in Europe, yeah. um, and not including Eastern Europe is different here, yeah. but so that your public poetry uh, and your private poetry come from the mm. same source, as it were, is that, is yes. that true? Yes, yes, and, and it's not only Ireland, although it, it's, it's mainly Ireland, but I remember well at the time of the Gulf War, uh, there were poems because all, all humanity was watching on the TV screen the, the, um, the bombing going on. And, uh, and so that came into the poetry. So all, you know, one, I, I've been very lucky in having, I think, many terrific teachers and mentors. And one of them was the, f the first, perhaps, was Patrick Kavanagh. And I feel what I learned from him was that all is grist to the mill. There, it's it, as it is for every human being, everything that's coming in you know, which for most of us, for good or for bad, is through the television set. Did you learn from Kavanagh as well the idea that comedy is, is always in the background, e even, even, even in the most difficult moments? Yes, not, uh, again, not being clever, Colin, in the foreground, because he set, wrote, said, and it was obvious from everything he felt about life in his last years, he, you know, he, he would criticise his own great poem, The, um, the uh, Great Hunger, saying it was underdeveloped comedy. And he, he said the hardest thing to achieve was the comic spirit. And he was dead serious. Because there is in your tone sometimes, for, for, the, for, for the, the listener or the reader, yeah. uh, and you don't know whether to laugh or cry. Yeah. And you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. And the sense is moving, hovering between tears and immense laughter at the same time. Yes. It's a very difficult tone to do, isn't it? It is. Uh, it, it, it's absolutely, but you see, this is where poetry, which I, I've never been able to articulate this, poetry and spirituality are interlinked in a way in the life of, say, Van Gogh is a very dramatic example, uh, Francis Bacon. Uh, and you can't separate the two. It's a way of looking at life. But like Patrick Kavanagh was a great poet, but I, I, I can't separate that from the fact that his journey, it, it, his journey, it was technically, uh, when, he, when it came off, he, he wrote some brilliant poems. But it was, you can't separate that from his vision of life, which at the end, he was, if Patrick had been put in the electric chair, you know, I, because of the enormous journey that he made in his life, I somehow, s somehow can see a smile breaking out on his face, or in, in his soul, and more importantly, in his soul. You know, it, it's, so it's technically... He was, he was a sort of premier Irish poet after Yeats. He died yeah. in 1967, and you were lucky enough as a young poet yeah. to meet him, spend time with him, yeah. 
uh, sort of drink with him yeah. and certainly take in his, his unique vision. Mm. I mean, in, in a way, he was the first poet in, in Irish independence from peasant background. That's right. And recreated himself in the city. Yes. And wrote both country poems and city poems. And yes. in the end, there's a sort of com there is a sort of comic vision, a lightness of touch, yes. no matter what he's dealing with. Which I, I call to myself a kind of Zen Buddhism, although I doubt if he ever read a word of Zen Buddhism. That touch, that, and uh, he was a very sophisticated, spiritually, a person. He was a great encourager of the young. And so I was very lucky to be on the receiving end of practical help from him. He got me, introduced me to his publisher in London, recommended me, all those sort of things mm. that most people don't do, you know. Mm. That's I said at the beginning that you were a sort of essential part of the fabric of Irish life. And the two things that have happened in Ireland in the last 20, 25 years mm -hmm. is a large change slowly coming about in the north where both sides had to face the idea that they would have to compromise. Mm. And there was no such thing as being pure you know, pure or, or pure Irish or pure British, that it all had mm. to melt in some way. Mm. And the second one in, in, in the Republic <coughs> claimed somehow mm. that we would all have to learn to be, certainly the hierarchy, the Catholic hierarchy, would have to mm. learn to be more tolerant and people in general then lower down would have to learn that too. Mm. And your poetry actually takes both of these issues on, you know, head first, mm. using a comic tone, mm. using whatever dramatic methods you had available mm. to you to say, first of all, something about the North. Mm. Mm. in the poems, mm. Mm. from very early on, from bef mm. really before it became popular or profitable to say that the violence was, say the IRA violence was wrong yes. in itself, was cruel, was yeah. unnecessary, mm. uh, that you wrote poems mm. very early on mm. saying that. Mm. Isn't that correct? Yes. Well, I mean, I come my fr from the Catholic Nationalist Republican basket, and, uh, and uh, I grew up in the IRA tradition, and so it, of, uh, there are poems to do with atrocities perpetrated by the loyalists, but theoretically my attitude to them was I didn't care what they did because it was what my side did. And it, but again, that's theoretical. The fact of the matter is that when someone is murdered virtually in front of your eyes, uh, you, you re react usually in such an articulate way it can't be published, uh, but, so, but sometimes that, they're, that they've come out with things that can be published. Uh, maybe all coming back to, I mean, theorizing about it, that all writing in the end is to do with war and peace. And, you know, this very day that we are sitting here, uh, you know, at, 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 at noon time, in the middle of the day, um, I spent part of the morning in a, in a bookstore, which was a cafe, the... Uh, of the Natural Acupuncture Institute in Colombia. Now, the atmosphere there was simply one of peace. Um, I couldn't find that cafe for quite a long time. And then trying to find it, I found myself in the army induction center. And there were... You didn't feel inclined to uh, join? There were young, Ameri young black American boys in very good form walking in and out. And I, two in particular, you know, I thought I could, certainly with the, the chap coming out, I could feel a kind of vision in his eyes as he came out with his, his new papers and his, and his gear. And, uh, you know, uh, those two sides of life in the space of an hour, that I think that's at the, that war and peace is at the bottom of it all. And the back, if we weren't sitting here now, I know I, I'd be sitting in Dublin at my television set very guilty, watching Sky News telling me about Israel. And, uh, and what I'd be, I'd be in deep depression, mm. deep melancholy, because it all, it's, 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 it's as if nothing ever changes. It's and, terrible violence. And you've also written about public, uh, as well as in the North, the whole business of war and peace. You've written about the other business of war and peace in the Republic, mm. which is that, I mean, Mary Robinson has quoted you, but you've quoted Mary Robinson. Mm. And also you've written about the hierarchy in mm. ways which have been both hilarious and pointed, mm. you know, so that, mm. that that war too has been part of your business as a poet. Yes, yes. The secularization in a way, the yeah. increasing tolerance in the Republic. Yeah, I mean, when, when I was starting off, you know, when I was 20 years of age, the Catholic Church was like the Communist Party in Eastern Europe, especially in the Soviet Union, 
uh, in, uh, visibly, even though it was all run by old men, the Kremlin, the Presidium, and men, 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 men who, had no, who mostly had no feelings for man or woman and who were very homophobic and anti The whole, we were all grew up in, a, in an absolute lunatic asylum of sexuality. And, uh, and so, uh, so you'll find a lot of my stuff is, to, is, is sort of work coming out of all of that. But in, in, in the last 30 years, the, the, you know, the, the Catholic Church in Ireland has nearly, has nearly, has nearly collapsed. Uh, and now I feel, you know, it just shows you how in so many ways life does change. I feel there's a merciless attitude on the part of the secular side of life yes. in Ireland towards, and therefore I feel more affinity with the priests and the nuns now. And I, uh, because I feel they're being, they're being hammered into the ground yeah. uh, in a way that I don't like. But yeah, that's how it has gone. Would, would you like to read another okay. poem? Um, yeah. Uh, this is um, Raymond of the Rooftops. The morning after the night, the roof flew off the house. And our sleeping children narrowly missed being decapitated by falling slates. I asked my husband if he would help me put back the roof. But no. He was too busy at his work, writing for a women's magazine in London, an Irish fairy tale called Raymond of the Rooftops. Will you have a heart, woman? He bellowed. Can't you see I'm up to my eyes and ears in work, breaking my neck to finish Raymond of the Rooftops? fighting against time to finish Raymond of the Rooftops, putting everything I have got into Raymond of the Rooftops. Isn't it well for him? Everything he has got. All I wanted him to do was to stand for an hour, maybe two hours, three at the most, at the bottom of the stepladder, and hand me up slates while I slated the roof. But no, once again I was proving to be the insensitive, thoughtless, feckless even, wife of the artist. There was I, up to my fat, raw knees in rainwater, worrying him about the hole in our roof, while he was up to his neck in Raymond of the Rooftops. Will you have a heart, woman? He bellowed. Can't you see I'm up to my eyes and ears and work, breaking my neck to finish Raymond of the Rooftops, fighting against time to finish Raymond of the Rooftops, putting everything I have got into Raymond of the Rooftops? Isn't it well for him, everything he has got? Um. You read exceptionally well. I've seen, you know, you get huge audiences um, wherever you go. And yet the books also sell as completely different things. I mean, the poems as read by the reader mm. privately at home in silence, mm. versus you reading them mm. out loud, mm. dramatically, mm. <clears throat> with, with sort of wonderful voice. When you're writing them, mm. what, what, what ear, what ear do you <clears throat> use as to who is the primary person they're for, mm. whether they're for the silent reader or your voice? <clears throat> Very good question, Colin. Without the one that I can answer, you know, 100% truthfully or accurately, for the silent reader. And it's an odd thing because obviously I have been asked that question before, but never so succinctly. And, uh, and, and, and in any case, it, it would be on a writer's mind from, from the day I started. Uh, but, and I'm now r finishing a book as we speak. And it, it seems, I have thought now, recently in these last few months, it's very odd, very odd. But I cannot bring myself to address the other voice you're speaking about. I'm not able to. And you I mean never the other voice being the? What you called, was it the public? Yeah, yes. You mean you yes. reading? Yes. That voice? I cannot, yes. So I never read the poems in a book, in a new book, until the book is published. So you have no notion of what poems you'll read when you perform, you have no, no notion of what they'll sound like. No. You're simply working on the silent words, yeah, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. 
Right. And I have read, I mean, I'm sure all of us in Ireland certainly have read, I think that, that William Butler Yeats used to, as he composed, used to walk up and down the room saying the poem aloud. But I've, I think I've heard, read or heard that over the years. But, and I've, tr I've felt, you know, to myself, seriously now, all joking apart, I felt that that's, I ought to be doing that. And you never do. No. And I'm not, a, you know, I think I should do it, but the impulse is just, is not there. So in a way you do the readings uh, in order to get people to read your books, to go home with them. So what, what's important for you is them going home alone with the book yes. and sitting alone with, with the, the poems. In the end, absolutely. So, yeah. that the, so in a way, what you're doing is, is building up an audience for the silence, as it were, in doing the readings. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's a, uh, a nice way of putting it. The only caveat I'd enter is that, that, uh, that it is the saying of poetry aloud is essential to what poetry is. It has, it's just these two, unlike the other forms of writing, perhaps, it, 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 in, in the end, the most important thing is the silent reading alone. Paul Durkin, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a million, Con. And thank you very much for watching this edition of The Writing Life. <laughs>